This is the Read to Lead podcast, episode 512. Please understand that when you choose a job in a company, you're not just choosing a job, you're really choosing a version of yourself. When you show up for work, make sure you're choosing your best self. Every organization is plagued by destructive friction, yet some forms of friction are incredibly useful, and leaders who attempt to improve workplace efficiency often make things even worse. Hi, I'm Jeff, and this is the Read to Lead podcast, the podcast dedicated to your personal and professional growth, where I believe that if you want to achieve true success in business and in life, then a part of that plan needs to be intentional and consistent reading. And of course, once you've done that reading, you put what you read into practice. That's the idea anyway. And that's what this show is designed to help you do. And the author helping us do that today is Huggy Rao. He's co-written a book with Robert Sutton called The Friction Project, How Smart Leaders Make the Right Things Easier and the Wrong Things Harder. I'll ask Huggy to share about some of the events and experiences that brought him to a place where he realized this book was needed. When it comes to addressing friction-filled issues, how a person's level of influence plays a role as to what steps to take, what we need to understand about our addition bias as humans, and how we can instead put a subtraction mindset to work, and much, much more. As this new year is well underway, I want to invite you to join folks like Nancy and Gary, two of our latest members inside the Read to Lead community. In fact, Nancy just joined yesterday, Gary just a few days ago, and they want to meet you, and so do I. And a Read to Lead Plus membership inside the Read to Lead community is perfect for rubbing shoulders with like-minded folks, people who take personal and professional development as seriously as you do, for example, a place where you'll find a continually growing library of business book summaries, articles that I write on topics like leadership, mindset, productivity, and more that are found nowhere else but inside the community, plus guest expert visits each and every month, as well as my own Ask Me Anything session. All that and more comprises a Read to Lead Plus membership, and it's just $9 a month. But if you're still on the fence, you can actually try it two weeks absolutely free, including perusing our back catalog of things like guest expert training recordings, recordings of my AMA sessions, and more. To find out all about it and get started right now, just go to this easy-to-remember website. It's my name, jeffbrown.me. And me, along with folks like Gary and Nancy, a couple of our newest members, hope to see you inside very, very soon. Huggy Rao is the Athol McBean Professor of Organizational Behavior at the Stanford Graduate School of Business and a fellow of the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Science, the Sociological Research Association, and the Academy of Management. He's written for Harvard Business Review, Bloomberg Business Week, and the Wall Street Journal. And he's the author of Market Rebels and co-author of the best-selling Scaling Up Excellence. His new book with Robert I. Sutton is called The Friction Project, How Smart Leaders Make the Right Things Easier and the Wrong Things Harder. Welcome to Read to Lead. Excited to have you here, and thanks for taking the time. Really appreciate it. A delight to be here with you this morning, Jeff. Thank you for having me here, and I'm very much looking forward to a conversation on the Friction Project. And a great project it is, and one that's been several years in the making, of course. Talk about some of the events and experiences that brought you to a place where you realize this kind of book is is needed. That's a great question, Jeff. Some of our listeners might have the view that people write books, they've got ideas in their head. But as you imply in your wonderful question, there is like a backstory to the origin of a book. In Bob uh, Sutton, my wonderful collaborator, co-conspirator and comrade and I, we wrote a book called Scaling Up Excellence that did really well. Mm. Uh, you know, it was a Wall Street Journal bestseller. I think of it as a little bit of a fluke, to be honest with you, but it was great. But, you know, we were happy to take it. And when we would teach the material, we instantly realized the me- the message really resonated with people in the C-suite and in the upper echelons of leadership in a company. But as you went lower down in the organization, people liked the ideas, but they lamented how hard it was to get anything done in their organizations. Mm. So these things kind of struck me 
at the very core, you know, they kind of touch your heart. Mm. Uh, and I remember after having taught material and scaling up excellence, I asked this participant in an executive education program at Stanford, I said, hey, where do you work? And the guy looks at me, smiles, <laughs> Jeff, and says, Professor, I work in a frustration factory. <laughs> That took me aback completely, you know. I'm like, oh, my God, how does this guy even get to work every day, get out of bed? You know, it it just was like mind boggling to me. And, you know, I thought, OK, maybe that's kind of one reaction. It wasn't clear to me how pervasive this was. Mm. Soon thereafter, I was teaching something on innovation and we were discussing pilot projects and, you know, what have you. And I remember asking one uh, executive, does your company have pilot projects? The guy looks at me, beams and says, (laughs) mischievously, Professor, we've got more pilots than American Airlines. (laughs) Now, just think about that. You know, a company with more pilot projects than all the pilots American Airlines has, it immediately tells you what the syndrome is. Mm. And then there were two other people that uh, really kind of profoundly touched both of us. One was a young engineer who listened to our ideas about scaling up excellence and with incredulity looked at me and said, Professor, he said, I'm swimming in a sea of shit in my company. I got my head barely above water, and you want me to show initiative and generosity? How is that possible? Mm. And another woman with her voice quivering said something that really shook me, Jeff. Mm. She said, my job's a lousy job. It consumes most of who I am every day. And when I go home, she said, all I've got left are scraps of myself for my family. And, you know, these things, when you kind of listen to them, you kind of say, oh, my God, you know, we really need to get into this. And that's kind of what started, of course, our journey into kind of friction land and eventually the book, experiments, research, case studies, so interviews with executives, teaching material, all of these finally came together in the form of a book. It's a little bit of a long story, but really it's the searing experiences of people in organizations that kind of shake you up a little bit and say, hey, that, you know, let's actually think of how we can make the world of work less of a grind. Well, as your uh, book's uh, subtitle indicates, there's there's two kinds of friction, right? There, there's good friction, there's bad friction. Uh, what would be some examples of each of these inside companies? If I were to summon an analogy or analogies, for me, when I think of friction, I think of friction as something very akin to cholesterol. You've got good cholesterol, you've got bad cholesterol. You've got good bacteria, you've got bad bacteria. Similarly, friction is also a double-edged sword. If you strip away all of the argumentation about friction, in the end, friction really boils down to obstacles. The point is, some of the the obstacles infuriate people. And because they infuriate people, they make it harder for employees to choose a more curious and generous version of themselves. Mm. You're so pissed off or you're so overwhelmed. <laughs> There's no reservoir that you can draw on to be curious or generous or anything like that. Mm. But on the other hand, what we kind of need, uh, you know, good friction consists of obstacles that slow people down. Otherwise, what do all of us do? We easily recruit a more overconfident and myopic version of ourselves. Mm-hmm. So you got to slow us down from choosing those versions of ourselves. Uh, so that gets you to focus. And then you get rid of bad friction. And that allows you to flow and show curiosity and generosity. Let me give you a couple of examples, uh, as you asked. If you look at uh, bad friction, mm-hmm. we actually were looking at the state of Michigan and their form they have for people to complete in order to get welfare. It is, how shall I put it, like a marathon of a form. <laughs> Hundreds of questions, including absurd questions such as, can you please tell us the day on which your child was conceived? <laughs> 
you know, how many people, I mean, like just how relevant is the question to the decision you're making? So that is an example of like bad friction or a study in the Journal of the American Medical Association that showed that residents actually spend 13% of their time interacting with patients and the rest of the time is email, records and like a whole bunch of things. And you're thinking like that doesn't make any sense. So those are examples of bad friction. When you think of like good friction, good friction uh, takes many forms, but I'm going to give you one vivid example or maybe two to drive home the point. In the city of Oakland uh, in 2018, I believe, stopped uh, 31,000 vehicles. Cops there had 31,000 traffic stops because they presumed people who were driving these vehicles were connected to a crime. Uh, Lots of times this assessment was entirely unfounded. Uh, they need to stop the vehicle, and most of the vehicles that were stopped uh, tragically were African American and Latino. So the interesting question is, how do you prevent this from happening? Now, one solution is more surveillance and cameras and all the things you know well. Mm. My wonderful colleague Jennifer Eberhardt, who was working with the Oakland police, came up with a simple idea, and she said, you know, we need to increase friction. It turns out cops at Oakland, uh, in Oakland, when they do a traffic stop, they've got to fill a form with three questions. Yes, no kinds of questions. She added a fourth one. And the fourth question was, do you have prior intelligence that connects this vehicle to a previously committed crime? If yes, stop. If no, let the car go. Mm -hmm. And as you can imagine, when a cop is thinking of stopping the car, they're also thinking of completing the form too, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. they're running through the questions in their head. And what she found was adding just this question alone led to a 31% decline in the number of traffic stops. So even though the traffic stops fell from 31,000 to around uh, 20,000 or so, Less African Americans, of course, were stopped, as were fewer Latinos. But the people in Oakland, ironically, felt safer. Mm. So that's an example of like introducing kind of good friction, if you will. Yeah. You mentioned police. Uh, I want to ask a forensics related uh, question. Uh, share a bit <laughs> about what you mean by uh, friction forensics and, and, and some of the questions you've developed to kind of help guide leaders' decision making. Yeah. So the thing that we sort of say is, you know, as a leader, your most fundamental responsibility is to be the trustee of other people's time. Mm. Lousy leaders waste other people's time. Mm. Great leaders, they kind of value other people's time. And what these leaders actually do is they actually dig down deeper to actually understand what's the cone of friction, what is happening. And all the time, these leaders think about what obstacles do I remove in order to make the right things easy? What obstacles do I insert to make the wrong things harder? So that's the big sort of question. Now, in terms of friction forensics, what we mean by that is we mean uh, a series of like diagnostic questions to promote reflection uh, and thought and deliberation to figure out what you can do to design a better organization. So the first kind of question is, what kind of decision are you making as an employee? Is this like a one-way door decision or a two-way door decision? One-way door decisions, of course, are, if you will, uh, decisions that are costly to reverse. Hiring a C-suite executive, acquiring a company, launching a product, expanding internationally, diversifying. You know all of this very well. On the other hand, two-way door decisions are super easy to reverse. The cost of failure is like pretty low. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not a big deal. So this being the first layer, what do you decide to do? Two-way door decisions remove friction, bad friction. You don't need to worry about it. Yeah. One-way door decisions, you better carefully think of what kind of friction are you going to actually inject into the organization. Mm -hmm. So the second kind of question that you can ask is, what's the task? Is it like a routine task or a creative task? Mm -hmm. In a creative task, you actually want to put good friction. 
I think uh, uh, it was Seinfeld who actually said uh, the right way to do it is the hard way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Ed Catmull of Pixar, when we were interviewing him about how they make a movie, he said, when you make a movie, you really have to introduce friction at various stages, lest you make a crappy movie fast that's going to flop. So there needs to be friction between finance and the creative people and within the creative people and the animators and, you know, all of these things. And so they try to kind of slow things down just a little bit. So if the work is creative, make sure you're actually injecting friction into the process. Mm. Similarly, what's the problem? Is it a complex problem or a simple problem? Simple problem, you know, you don't need to worry about inserting good friction or doing anything. It's when a problem is complex that you actually want to introduce, uh, if you will, constructive friction because people slow down, they open their eyes, they think carefully about what you can do. So, you know, uh, I could go on, but these are, I would say, the core kind of like friction forensic questions, if you will. And there are We add three or four more, and I don't want to uh, inflict on our listeners a litany of like questions, but these three, four questions hopefully highlight the forensics kind of process. As it, Uh, when it comes to uh, addressing some of these issues, uh, one thing I think is of note is to address how does a person's level of influence play a role as to what steps to take. Great question. A great question. So in our book, uh, one of the things, uh, Jeff, that we have is we actually think of this as like a health pyramid. Mm -hmm. So if you're a leader, you know, the problem with most leaders I feel in companies is they they use the ask muscle most of the time. Mm -hmm. Under various guises, they go to people and say, hey, we want you to do more. Sometimes more and more, other times more with less. I mean, that's kind of, I'm oversimplifying, but you get the idea. You know, the friction leaders as trustees of other people's time and as uh, friction fixers, they realize, hey, I could be the leader of a team, a department, a division, a company, what have you. And so there's a help pyramid. So the lower your influence, the kinds of things that you can do to help your people are to reframe what is actually happening. You might think friction actually is overwhelming you. Might you actually think of this as a little bit of an opportunity, Mm. you know, a simple kind of example. Uh, So it's not a threat, but an opportunity for you to do more things. At other times, what leaders can do is they can be like um, navigators or trail guides. Uh, Bob and I were having a very interesting conversation with the DMV in California, and they're doing amazing things. Mm. So if you go to the DMV now, they've shortened the amount of time it takes you to get your real ID. Uh, they were, you know, they want to make it quick and fast. So what do they do? You stand in line. And the first thing that happens is there's a DMV person who walks through the line asking people, what are you here for? Lots of people are there under the erroneous impression that they can get a passport at the DMV. Hmm. You immediately shorten the line and say, hey, you're not getting the passport here. You got to go to someplace and do that. Hmm. You know, so. And that's like another level. You can be a trail guide and help them navigate throughout the organization. The third thing you can do is if you have more power, you can actually shield people. Mm-hmm. You know, you provide the air cover and you take the heat, if you will. And then the next two levels are when you have significant influence and the significant influence leads you to say, hey, we really need to design, redesign the neighborhood of our group or our department or eventually the entire organization. So the more influence you have, the more ability you have to engage in design. So the design element of the friction fixer takes lead roles, if you will. Mm. On the other hand, if you have lower influence, friction fixing also has, a, if you will, quote unquote, a therapy component. And that actually comes to the fore when your influence is lower. Mm. Does that help? It helps a lot. Thank you. I appreciate uh, you unpacking that for us. Well, the next section of the book I want to talk about before we wrap addresses the friction traps or uh, the intervention points for friction fixers, I think you, you call it. Mm-hmm. Uh, talk about specifically power poisoning by oblivious leaders and, and some of the, the symptoms to watch out for. So in our book, uh, you know, one of the things we sort of say is organizations just get engulfed by bad friction through f- five different friction ramps. 
ramps. Mm. So you're kind of going into bad friction land through five ramps. It's like you're getting on that freeway. Mm. One of the ramps is the obliviousness of leader. Now, we need to kind of understand why is it leaders get to be oblivious in the first place? (laughs) You know, we don't want to accuse them of willful blindness or anything of that kind. You know, what the research shows is in organizations, the more powerful we are or we feel we are, the more likely we have tunnel vision because powerful people don't need to search. Who searches? It's only when you don't have power. You say, hey, how did this thing happen? What caused what? And what do I do? And how do I adapt? And those kinds of things. When you have power, you don't need to worry about all of that. So the first problem is this kind of tunnel vision. The second sort of problem is some studies are now showing that C-suite leaders don't really understand how work gets done three mm-hmm. levels beneath <laughs> And the problem is, if you really don't know how work gets done three levels beneath you, you assume everything is easy because you don't understand coordination difficulty. One study shows that such leaders underestimate coordination difficulty by 50%. So you can imagine, you know, you have plenty of illusion. Illusion can quickly harden into impatience. Mm -hmm. Uh, You say and do things and people respond to you. Even your slightest whim gets translated into uh, an organizational priority, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, So let me give you examples of obliviousness. Two quick, one example of how people were oblivious and another what executives do in order to prevent obliviousness. Mm -hmm. So in this company, we were speaking with the senior executives and we asked them a very innocent question. Hey, how long do you guys spend in your executive team meeting? And I looked at the six of us. We meet once a week for an hour. So six hours a week times 52. It's like very simple math. And then we said, you know, but that's the amount of time you spend. How much time does the rest of the organization spend in order to ensure you guys have a meeting? And when they actually kind of dug into it, they discovered the rest of the organization was spending 300,000 hours to support their one hour meeting. And then you ask them, what kind of like return are you getting for these 300,000 hours? Have you thought about it? Mm -hmm. Have you thought of ways of making your meetings kind of more productive and so on? So that's kind of an example of obliviousness. Mm -hmm. Let me give you another rich example of how an executive overcame obliviousness. Mm -hmm. The best way to remove obliviousness for C-suite leaders is for them to consciously decide to be in low power positions. Because when you're in a low power position, you're really seeing what's going on. Let me give you an example. This actually had to do with Office Depot. The CEO was receiving two signals. They would send mystery shoppers into Office Depot stores. And, you know, they would look at, you know, is it brightly lit? Are they wearing the right uniforms? And all the questions mystery shoppers invariably look at. And, you know, Office Depot was acing all these mystery shopper evaluations. But the CEO also gets another report, same store sale sale. You know, how much did you sell the month before, the quarter before, and how much are you selling now? Mm. And that line was plunging downward. And he said, this is nuts. How can we do so well on mystery shoppers and why aren't we selling? So he says, how am I going to find this out? I got to go to a store. So he goes, parks in front of an office depot. They open it around nine in the morning. The bunch of traffic going in and he says, thank God there's inbound traffic. Mm -hmm. That's not like a problem. And much to his consternation, uh, five minutes later, he sees all these people walking out without shopping bags. And he says, hey, how did that happen? And he goes inside, instantly senses the problem. What's the problem? Right at the time, small business people used to come to home, I mean, office depot at nine in the morning, the workers in the store are stacking product on the shelf. You know, they're not showing their face to the customer, but they're showing their bags to the Mm. customer. Why were they doing that? The warehousing guy said, well, the convenient time for us to ship product is at 7.30. You'll get it at 8.30. You stack it. Nobody ever thought of the customer. And you see the obliviousness problem. Well, let's talk about uh, something that I'm fascinated by. I've read about this before in the Lego study uh, in particular. What do we need to understand about our addition bias as humans and, and how we can instead put a subtraction mindset to work and why, and why we would want to in the first place. 
Yeah, you know, the I'm, I'm glad you really were fascinated by the addition bias. It's actually something that is now receiving attention. There was a recent paper that showed, you know, via a series of Lego building exercises, it was just 11% of the time people made recommendations to reduce complexity. Mm. The remainder of the time, they were adding things, all of which increased complexity. Now, the problem is we, of course, have a bias to add. Organizations also reward addition. Mm -hmm. Who gets promoted? Well, Jeff gets promoted when Jeff, Jeff introduces a new budgeting system mm -hmm. that requires people to learn three new kinds of software. For example. <laughs> I mean, I'm just kind of making up things here, but you get the idea. Yeah. So we all get rewarded for addition. We have the addition bias. And the problem is in organizations, Nobody thinks about subtraction. So subtraction is kind of like an orphan problem. So if everybody is adding, you have a classic tragedy of the commons problem. Our the 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 pasture of attention is actually all going away because everybody's overgrazing. Uh, and that overgrazing means that we have less grass on the pasture, you know, in this hypothetical kind of example of the tragedy of the commons. So it is an orphan problem. Mm. So the way we think about subtraction is a lot of organizations try and subtract, but their mentality is it's one and done. You say, okay, we're going to reduce the number of meetings. And you do that. And for like one month, you reduce the number of meetings and they come back again. Uh, you know, it's kind of like a whack-a-mole situation, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, instead, what we, Bob and I kind of recommend and indeed think of subtraction is that it is like mowing the lawn. Mm. How often do we have to mow the lawn? Pretty regularly, I would imagine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Otherwise, if you don't mow the lawn, what's going to happen? Can you actually plant a new sapling there? Mm -hmm. No way. The weeds are going to kill all the new saplings. And mm -hmm. that's the problem. Mm -hmm. So if we want to really address the addition bias, we have to mow the lawn. And you can start with the simplest of things. So the simplest of things is what Bob and I refer to as good riddance reviews. You know, what are all the obstacles you want to kind of rid the organization out of? Mm. And a great example of this was actually done by Dr. Melissa Ashton, a doctor at Hawaii Pacific. And what she did was she said, hey, we just need to get rid of stupid stuff. <laughs> I mean, it sounds so obvious and simple. Mm. Now, how often have organizations made it easy for their employees to get rid of stupid stuff? Not often. <laughs> and that's the problem. Mm. So that's like a good place to start. And then you can do lots of things in order to cope with addition. You could, of course, make somebody a subtraction czar. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and some companies have done it. In one company, Hootsuite, uh, it was kind of uh, fascinating. This executive found that they were trying to ship a $15 T-shirt and all the shipping costs and everything when he had it, it was amounting to $200. Mm -hmm. And he thought it was nuts. Mm -hmm. Spending 200 bucks trying to ship a $15 T-shirt. And so they made him the czar of like bad systems, as they kind of called it. <laughs> That's certainly something organizations do. Mm -hmm. And then you go up. The most potent way of mowing the lawn for us is to really create a social movement within the organization to mow the lawn and to deal with this addition sickness. And a great example of that was a case study Bob and I wrote about AstraZeneca. A team of 40 people spearheaded a social movement in the company in 2019. And as they were mowing the lawn, they saved the company 2 million hours. Mm. Look at the way they're measuring the benefit. It's not in terms of full-time employees saved. It's 1148 employees they could have saved, but they were interested in saving 2 million hours. And why did they want to save 2 million hours? They actually wanted to give the gift of time back to the company and to people. To do what? To serve 4 million more customers, run 400 early phase trials and 26 late phase trials. Mm -hmm. So... You can imagine that when you organize a movement like this, it's just not these people spearheading the movement. I was talking to the leader of this effort, a wonderful uh, executive by the name of Pushkala Subramaniam. And I said, you know, like, was this all of you doing this? Was it like a group of elite managers or did the rank and file get involved? And she said, let me give you an example. 
when you go to Astro at eight in the morning, uh, people kind of show up at 745 or 750 and you got to show your ID and there's a security gate that goes up and down. Mm -hmm. And usually there's a traffic jam. People spend half an hour there. Mm -hmm. So they had a world simplification day. And the next day she goes to work. There's no traffic jam. There's no line. And she asks the security guard. The guy isn't an employee of Astro. He works for a security contractor whom Astro contracted as the security service. So he's not even an employee. So he asked, she asked the security guard, hey, what happened to the traffic jam and ID and going this? And the guy looks at her and says, madam, I heard you had a world simplification day yesterday. You're trying to give employees the gift of time. I thought I could give each of you half an hour every day. I mean, just think of that, Jeff. Mm. Just think of that. I mean, there are ways to really kind of deal with the addition sickness. Mm -hmm. uh, most of all, what we really need to do is uh, we, we, we really got to make sure that we organizations start out like speedboats and then they become encrusted in barnacles. And we got to actually kind of get rid of those barnacles, get rid of all the obstacles that infuriate people yeah. and make it hard for them to either be curious or either be generous. You know, broken connections, uh, coordination problems, in other words, is is another trap uh, that is uh -huh. about in the book. And I was, I guess, not shocked. Uh, maybe that's the right word. Uh, some of the examples in particular, I think it was the cancer center mm. and just how uh, just, just the, the, the lack of coordination between departments along the patient journey, I guess. Mm. Why do we often tend to neglect coordination in our organizations, would you say? In fact, neglect is absolutely the uh, right word. The reasons... Um, we neglect coordination is we focus on a component rather than the whole. Mm. So in this cancer context, uh, uh, where Melissa Valentine, our colleague, studied what she referred to as a cancer tax, all that the physicians cared for was they focused on their speciality. So weaving together a course of treatment for the patient was left to the patient himself or herself. The related reason is we not only have a component focus, we like to partition. Mm. And so once you kind of partition, uh, again, you have this coordination focus. And the other thing is we not only neglect coordination, we disdain coordination. Mm. Uh, we kind of look down on it. In fact, if you really look at organizations, the people who really do the coordination uh according to some studies, are disproportionately women. Mm. They schedule, they are, you know, all of these kinds of coordinating things they, they kind of devote a lot of time to. Right. But their perspective, and rightly so, is, hey, people think of this as office housework. And so therefore, nobody's rewarded for it. Nobody's kind of recognized for it. You can imagine if that office housework isn't done, what's likely to happen mm. to the organization? So part of what we've got to do is, we re the way to remove coordination neglect, the first thing to kind of start with, if I can say that is, you don't need to treat friends like enemies. Mm. You know, and the story that we write about in the book is this very moving story of Brandy Chastain, the accomplished athlete and soccer player. So it was interesting. Apparently, her grandfather used to pay Brandy a buck for scoring a goal, but a buck fifty for an assist. Mm. And when she asked him why, and he would tell her, because it's better to give than to receive. I mean, it's a simple kind of story, but you can imagine, you know, how uh, there are people who kind of coordinate and do things and, you know, so on. Uh, it's interesting in the Women's World Cup, uh, the Ballon d'Or winner uh, was actually a midfielder. And what do midfielders do uh, in a soccer field? They kind of coordinate. They're kind of the glue that connect uh, the defense with the offense, passing the ball, doing all of these kinds of things. So we really need to make sure we invest in coordination. And you know, when I say invest in coordination, I don't mean like appointing people as liaisons and all that and creating more bureaucracy necessarily. We've really got to figure out ways of creating like common knowledge. 
Mm. So that people transfer knowledge from one person to another, like pretty easily. Our MBA student years ago in a course Bob and I taught, did a wonderful job when they actually helped the U.S. Army uh, soldiers who were in forward operating bases in Afghanistan. So how do you transfer knowledge from a soldier that's leaving the place with a new person who's joining? Mm. They're not going to read a survey, a report, or anything like that. And our student, this was actually pre-Zoom days, and our students actually came up with a simple idea. They told the soldier, hey, can you talk to the soldier who's replacing you for like 15 minutes or so? If you do that, we'll give you an hour of Skype time with their your family. Mm. Predictably, this was a good incentive. But what was interesting were the stories that were told. So they would ask the soldiers to say, tell the person replacing you a story of what happened to you when you got in, something at the midpoint of your deployment, something mm. as you were leaving the place. So you've got three stories and you get a sense of what goes on there. And often when I would listen to some of these calls, the stories were of ambushes, you know, Oh my God, we forgot to take our sunglasses. Light mm. shining on our eyes. We can't mm. see the enemy because we're going uphill. Nobody checked the comms. So you're under fire. You can't summon air support through your radio. Mm. And on and on the thing goes. And these stories are vivid and people retain them. So mm. you can actually create coordination through story. In fact, there's research that suggests that people who hear the same story, the same portions of their brain light up in fMRIs. And this is a form of a shared brain, if you will. Mm. I want to ask you if there's anything from the book I've not brought out of you that you would like to make sure that uh, the listeners walk away with before I move on to a couple of questions not directly related to the book. The, the thing I would really like all of the listeners to think about is, Please understand that when you choose a job in a company, you're not just choosing a job, you're really choosing a version of yourself. Mm. When you show up for work, make sure you're choosing your best self. We all have many selves, but you got to choose your best self. What's your the best self for any of our listeners or for you and me, Jeff? One simple way to think about the best self is for us to think of a time when we have accomplished something. We've climbed a mountain, we're feeling accomplished, but yet tired. What were the three actions you were doing when you went through that experience? Think of three verbs or adverbs, not nouns or adjectives, verbs and adverbs, challenging, questioning, whatever. You know, so people can easily visualize that. Th those are the building blocks of your best self. And think of two stories that bring those three action words to life. That is our best self. So if you look at me, my best self has a lot to do with being curious, asking questions, ferreting out things, and also being generous and helpful. The most important question for us to ask is, how much of our time every day do we choose our best self in? Now, nobody can recruit their best self 100% of the time every day at work. But, uh, you know, I would surmise that if you're able to do that at least 50% of the time every day, you're doing fabulously. Mm -hmm. But if you're only recruiting your best self 5% of the time, you likely are spread thinly like peanut butter mm -hmm. on a slice of toast mm -hmm. and ask yourself, what is it I need to eliminate and prune? So, in short, what I'm asking listeners to do is be editors-in-chief of your own jobs so that you're able to recruit more of your best self. Mm. And by the way, your best self is not just at work. Make sure you show up with your best self at home too, not with the scraps of yourself. So that would be like the big piece of advice, uh, if I might label it that way for our listeners, mm. that's not in the book. Well said. Uh, you asked me before we officially started uh, some of my favorite books. I'm going to turn that question on on you now and ask you to recommend a book or two that has had an impact on you, would you say? Maybe uh, impacted your career early on, or maybe it's a more recent book. What, what, what comes to mind when I ask that question? As I sort of think about your question, Jeff, I would say the book that actually probably the most long-lasting impact was one of the first books I ever read when I was a kid. Uh, you know, I mean, these were days when you would read uh, kind of the equivalence of Nancy Drew and like whatever. Uh, but, you know, 
I was young and I wanted to show my dad I could like read and do things because mm-hmm. in our family, that was like one of the cultural kind of elements, reading mm-hmm. and talking. And so I looked at my dad's bookshelf and, you know, I thought just to show off to my dad, I'd better pick the fattest book, you know. <laughs> and it so turned out the fattest book was a spectacular book called The Spirit of St. Louis, written by Charles Lindbergh. Mm. And I must have been a boy of 10 or maybe a little younger. I could not put the book down (laughs) because the book is written, you know, all the things he had to do before he could like build the plane and then the journey from New York to uh, Le Bourget in Paris. And so it's hour 24 and hour 23 and, you know, all of this. And what that book did to me was it really kind of made me realize that Life is kind of more about journeying than about reaching a destination. Mm. So your goals have to do with journeys rather than with destinations. And that's kind of always, always uh, stayed with me. So that was like a very powerful, powerful kind of uh, book. The other book that I would say that also left uh, like an indelible imprint on me was Cornelius Ryan's The Longest Day. Mm. I'm a little bit of a World War II buff. And The Longest Day is a marvelous book that actually shows so many, you know, the the Allied invasion of Normandy occurred across many beaches. Mm. And what kind of like amazed me about the book was how ordinary people did extraordinary things. (laughs) Yeah, And that kind of blew my mind. So if I were to think of books, those, those books, you know, they're kind of like, uh, how shall I put it, uh, very powerful books. And of course, there's poetry, there's other things. But for me, who was it? Uh, I think maybe it might have been Victor Hugo who said this, and maybe I'm, ch- I'm ch- probably channeling him when I say this. And he said, you know, what books do is they light a fire. Mm. And each syllable or each word is like a spark. And you have no idea which word or which set of words is going to kind of like create that kind of fire. But that's kind of what great books do. They create a fire. They lead to conversation, most importantly. You know, so to me, that's Mm. kind of what matters about reading and books. And I love going to the library regularly. I would agree with that starting a fire kind of sentiment, uh, you know, whether it's books or whether it's uh, whatever we're reading for learning and growth might be articles online. It uh, could be a podcast we're listening to as an academic and someone who does quite a bit of research and is bringing in content into your brain from different sources and having uh, seemingly disparate ideas crash into one another in the process that then mm-hmm. creates you know, new things. What are some of your strategies or, or tactics or both for just managing personal knowledge to, to ensure that the things that you learn along life's journey don't get lost, that you're able to then take those things and create with them later? That's a great uh, question. You know, for me, what I found is it's not only acquiring knowledge that's important, it's sharing it that's important. Mm. I find the act of sharing as we are doing, for example, in this conversation, that's kind of what keeps all the learnings active and um, alert. But the other thing I do is, uh, you know, it shapes the way I organize my life. So I get up pretty early every morning, you know, 4.35, a cup of coffee, and then I work and my mind is very clear. There's no interruption. I'm kind of like really a morning person. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm at my best. Uh, And what I find is 4.30 onwards until maybe 1.32, I'm okay. And after 1.32, what I find is I make faster decisions. I'm kind of tired and I tend to screw up. So, you know, and I know this about myself. And since I know this about myself, what do I do? I never make an important decision about my life after 12 o'clock in the afternoon. I know I'm going to make it fast. I probably am going to be wrong. So bad idea. Do it before 12. You're going to look at data, be more deliberate, more thoughtful, all of those things. Interesting. Well, the book, again, from Huggy Rao, co-written with uh, Robert Sutton, is called The Friction Project, How Smart Leaders Make the Right Things Easier and the Wrong Things 
harder. Uh, it's been a treat talking to you, Huggy. Thank you again so much for taking the time and being a part of the uh, the Read to Lead journey. Thank you so very much, Jeff, for asking me thoughtful and provocative questions. And it was a delight to be part of the conversation today. Huggy and Robert's book is officially out today and is a number one new release in the workplace culture category. You'll find a link to their book along with the books that Huggy recommended, as well as the other resources and links mentioned at the show notes page for this episode. That is readtoleadpodcast.com slash 512 for episode 512. Again, readtoleadpodcast.com slash 512. Next week's show, we're scheduled to have Ali Abdal as our guest. He is the world's most followed productivity expert. He's a former physician, now a full-time entrepreneur, started a YouTube channel back in 2016, now has 5.15 million followers on YouTube alone. His content is excellent, and I can't wait to introduce to you his new book called Feel Good Productivity, How to Do More of What Matters to You. Again, that's next week on the Read to Lead podcast. Well, that does it for this week. Hope to see you next time when Ali visits. Until then, as always, remember, leaders read and readers lead. Read.